The president has just spoken. Yesterday, the last U.S. troops left Afghanistan, ending America's longest war. But with the, draw, the withdrawal has been far from smooth. 13 American service members and an estimated 170 Afghans were killed by a suicide bomber at the gate of the Kabul airport last week. Over the past month, some 5,400 Americans have been evacuated, though between 100 and 200 U.S. citizens who wish to leave are still there. In a few minutes, experts react to the president and follow up on the situation in Afghanistan. But we'll start a little closer to home with the aftermath of Hurricane Ida, where we are with rescue efforts and what's going on with their power grid. Plus, our phone lines are open. 888-486-9677. Town Square with Ernie Manus is made possible with support from listeners like you. Subscribe to our daily podcast and find episodes at townsquaretalk.org. First, here's the news. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus, and this is Town Square. Coming up, experts react to the president's remarks as we delve into the current situation in Afghanistan post-U.S. withdrawal. You can share your questions and comments at 888-486-9677. That's 888-4-Town Square. But first, what is continuing to happen with Hurricane Ida recovery efforts? What are survivors going through? What are their needs? And how can Houstonians help? Joining me right now to begin this discussion is John Mills. He's an external affairs officer for FEMA, and he's currently on the ground in Louisiana. Hello there, John. Hi, Ernie. Uh, good afternoon. I'm in Kenner, Louisiana, near New Orleans. Thanks for having me. Uh, I guess the best place to start with this conversation is what are you seeing? How, how bad are things? Uh, I, I think people should continue to listen to their local officials. There are a, a lot of areas, obviously, the closer... To where you get to where landfall was, uh, the worse it is. Uh, mm -hmm. Cell phone service, thankfully, is returning, uh, but there's a lot of damage and widespread power outages in the New Orleans area. And so far, the power company uh, that services this area uh, is not giving a very good prognosis in terms of timelines. Yeah. Um, I have heard on the news, and they continue to repeat this, just because the rain has passed, people should not plan to return to the area if they evacuated, correct? That's correct, and and FEMA was anticipating this, and FEMA's not in the lead. The state of Louisiana's in the lead, and FEMA's in a supporting role, and we're coordinating across the entire federal government when the state makes requests uh, based on its needs and based on requests that local communities are requesting through the state. We can help locate resources. FEMA might provide it, but we're also working closely with our FEMA urban search and rescue teams that have come from a variety of states uh, and were pre-deployed before landfall. Those urban search and rescue teams are supplementing local and state responders. They came from places like Missouri, Ohio, Colorado, Indiana to support those local first responders and rescue folks uh, from the water. The, we're also working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It has power restoration teams, debris management and roofing experts on the ground mobilized here in Louisiana. Uh, we've been really prioritizing life-saving, life-sustaining operations We've already begun working one-on-one -on -one with disaster survivors. Uh, we've been contacted by thousands of people already. Uh, so the good news is people have been able to get through to us on the phone to apply for federal disaster assistance if they have losses not covered by insurance. And it's also been good to see that we've had thousands of people contact us uh, at disasterassistance.gov on their mobile devices uh, or whatever other device they're using to get online. Uh, so despite power outages, uh, people have been able to communicate with us uh, by the tens of thousands to let us know their needs. Uh, I'll ask you to repeat this just because I know that we have a lot of folks who left what were going to be very damaged areas and turned out to be damaged. They're in our area right now listening. Can you tell people again how they can reach out to FEMA if they need FEMA help? Sure. And it's important to remember, and, and the, the good news is a lot of people in Louisiana have insurance coverage to protect them from hurricane damage, wind damage. Uh, people also, in, in the, I think we have four or 500,000 flood insurance policies that insurance companies sell, but FEMA's national flood insurance program backs up. So the first thing to do is to submit your insurance claim for your damage. Mm -hmm. By law, FEMA, by law, is not allowed to duplicate insurance payments. Right. So if your home is uninhabitable as a direct result of Hurricane Ida, uh, FEMA can help with losses not covered by insurance 
and we are working one-on-one with homeowners and renters. We can help with basic home repairs uh, to help make your home habitable again. If you need to relocate because you can't live in your home because it's uninhabitable, uh, we can provide you with rental assistance money so you can live somewhere else temporarily. And we're also helping survivor with survivors with other needs money to help them replace essential personal property that was damaged or destroyed. And there is a, a contact process. I can give you that information if you think it'll be of benefit to people who are listening in the Houston area. But again, this is only for Louisiana. Right. Yes, definitely. I think probably people relocated here to avoid the storm and now they're unsure of what they're going to return to. So it wouldn't be bad to have that number on hand. Sure. What should they have? Sure thing. Right. So uh, the the easiest way to contact us is at disasterassistance.gov. That's disasterassistance.gov. Uh, you can access that through any web browser. You can also download the FEMA app and follow the steps to contacting us, and that'll walk you through to disasterassistance.gov as well. If you want to talk to a real person or if you've registered online, you've applied online for federal assistance, and you want to ask questions, the phone number is 800-621-3362. That's 800-621-3362. English and Spanish and other languages are available, and you'll talk to a real person. Just know that because of the size of the disaster, Mm -hmm. some of the wait times might be longer than normal, but a lot of people have been getting through by the tens of thousands and applying uh, by phone. John, before I let you go to get back to the work that you need to be doing, any guess at how many people were affected at this point? Well, the, you know, a huge part of of Louisiana was affected in terms Mm -hmm. of the damage. It appears that a lot of buildings uh, came through really, really well. Uh, unfortunately, right. people who are in high-risk flood zones probably got flooding. The storm surge was a little bit lower than some of the most dire forecasts, so that's the good news. But we're hearing from tens of thousands of people. We're still working to do joint damage assessments with local communities and the state, and we're also very heavily focused on life-stabilizing operations, such as stabilization of hospitals. A lot of them are still on generator power. We're supporting the emergency distribution of commodities like food and water to support sheltering operations. And we have emergency temporary power, such as generators on hand to support requests we get from the state uh, for facilities uh, such as hospitals uh, that could face that need if the power stays off in a significant way across a large area. So we're trying to stay very situationally aware about the power situation, because once you get the power back on, the recovery can begin very quickly when grocery stores and such start Mm -hmm. opening again. Uh, But right now, that's a really big challenge here uh, because of the uh, power restoration issues, in particular in Metro New Orleans. John, uh, another question that I'm concerned with is the impact of this alongside what's going on with COVID in the area. Uh, Special precautions you folks are taking or what are you encountering and how is this complicating your job? Uh, Well, FEMA has been coordinating on the federal side the response to the COVID-19 pandemic for more than a year and a half, we have very close partnership with the Department of Health and Human Services and and CDC. Uh, And and so we are taking COVID precautions. We have mandatory masking requirements among our response staff who are physically here uh, in Louisiana and supporting from uh, other locations and federal facilities. We have masking requirements. Uh, We have a lot of virtual support. We are going to be putting people uh, on the ground in the hard hit areas, especially at some of those points of distribution that have been mentioned on the national NPR uh, reporting. So when the city stands up cooling uh, locations and points of distribution for emergency food, water and other supplies, uh, FEMA is expected to have uh, some of our disaster survivor assistance crews. there helping folks. but They're going to take COVID precautions. And we would ask that whenever possible, people who speak with us face to face, Uh, wear a face covering, wear a mask uh, because of the COVID pandemic. Our staff will be wearing uh, face coverings, and we incorporate that into our entire response, not just in Louisiana, but everywhere we're doing business these days. What are we finding with hospitals? You know, there have been some uh, hospital evacuations. Fortunately, uh, uh, not uh, all of the hospitals. There are a lot of generators that are actively functioning right now. One of the issues is it's really hard to get fuel at gas stations. Power is still out at a lot of gas stations, and some gas stations that uh, do have power are out of gas. 
Some gas stations have diesel, but not gas. And so uh, those are problems. Uh, when hospitals make requests through their local emergency management and the parishes, the parishes will try to source requests for, uh, for fuel locally. Uh, if they're short on resources, they're reaching out to the state emergency management and the governor. Uh, and then we are working closely with the governor's office and state emergency management if we get those requests. And that's why we have a, a lot of important federal agencies, such as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which can bring a lot of temporary power debris removal to bear, uh, along with a number of other federal agencies. Uh, you know, FEMA is part of DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. So we're coordinating with the U.S. Coast Guard, which is also part of DHS. Coast Guard has something like 27 rotary or fixed wing assets. Uh, Department of Defense has 60 high water vehicles, 14 rotary wing assets. They were all pre-positioned to help with search and rescue. So we're still very much engaged in working with local communities in the state to save as many lives as possible, but now we're moving into the phase of sustaining lives. And the longer the power is out, the, the greater that need, because the concern is that some frustration could build for obvious reasons. If your power's been out, the more, the more days it's out, and the, the longer you can't go to the grocery store, the greater the needs. So we're very, very focused on that and working in close coordination so that we can respond quickly when we get requests from the state for emergency supplies and resources. John, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us. We'll hopefully be able to check back with you later on and hear really great news when you come back to me and say everything's back to normal. Thank you, John. Thanks for your time, Ernie. John Mills is an external affairs officer with FEMA, currently on the ground in Louisiana. Up next, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into all this and find out what's going on with the power. Our number here is 888-486-9677. We'll be right back. I'm Ernie Manus, and this is Town Square. Coming up, what happens next in Afghanistan? What's the situation post-U.S. withdrawal? We'll discuss with military and sociological experts. Our phone lines are open for your questions and comments, 888-486-9677. That's 888-4-Town Square. But right now, we continue our discussion about the impact of Hurricane Ida. Joining me now are Steve Fleming, Operations Support Senior Associate with Team Rubicon. Hello there, Steve. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for being with us, and already thank you for the work you're doing out there. Also joining us is Ed Hers, a regular guest on the show. He's an energy fellow from the University of Houston. Hello, Ed. Hi, Ernie. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start with you, Ed, just because we're here in Houston and we've already had our issues with the power grid. Explain to me what is going on in Louisiana that is leading to such a long delay, we believe, until we can get power back. How can this be happening in today's day and age? Uh, it's very simple. The wires are exposed. Uh, you know, they're all carried above ground on poles. Uh, they're subject to wind forces, and it's, it's pretty clear that energy with eight uh, main lines into the city of New Orleans had all eight of them fail. Um, you know, this is, this is a terrible situation. Uh, you know, the videos, uh, of, of the devastation are, are, you know, well, they're everywhere. Uh, you know, there's a, the big transmission line across the river and that tower buckled and, uh, the president or the CEO of Energy Louisiana said, you know, well, we, we inspected that tower. It was here during Katrina, you know, but this storm had an awful lot of wind force. And uh, the, the, the pressure exerted goes up exponentially with the speed of the wind. And, uh, you know, there can be twisting motions. There can, you know, lots of debris was flying around. So an impact could have, could have uh, uh, knocked the legs out from some of these towers or uh, taken the wires down. And, yeah, you know, it could be just as simple as, as uh, you know, tree limbs on some of the others. It's, it, you know, we're just speculating because they haven't been right. able to get out and, and see what happened. But it just seems like there is, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong here, but a lack of redundancy and protection of these things. And so well, you knock down a few of them, and you're going to be out for three weeks with no energy. Well, I remember you know, being here in the aftermath of hurricanes and, and not having power for you know, several days and, and up to three weeks before Centerpoint could get the grid restored. And, right. and we haven't been hit by something like Ida. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it's not just New Orleans, but, but everything south of New Orleans. I mean, think of Hurricane Andrew that, that went across Florida. Um, they've, they've hardened their grid. It, it cost them an awful lot to do it. 
Uh, but you know, it can be done. These 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 uh, grid infrastructures can be engineered to those uh, extreme uh, weather situations. Um, it just costs money, and you know, the city of New Orleans is the regulator for energy in the city, and it, it's it's a cost benefit analysis. Uh, you know, I'm sure that they could they could engineer the towers to stand up to 220 mile an hour winds, and that's probably going to cost them four times what it would cost to to have it withstand 150 mile an hour winds. Mm -hmm. Steve, let me ask you this: with the work Team Rubicon is doing, how how difficult is it being in an area with no power? Well, being in the disaster space is, is challenging on many fronts, communication being just one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, our teams are, are set up for success with multiple different levels of communication depending on their tasking. So right now we're, we're moving recon teams and we have route clearance teams clearing the way for first responders, search and rescue, or, or power and utility um, teams. Um, and they're, they're equipped with uh, satellite communications in some areas is, is the only way that, that we can get through. Uh, and with that comes um, delays in photos, delays in being able to, to make phone contact with emergency services or emergency management personnel um, before our teams go in there. But once, once our teams are able to get in the doors of these EOCs, we're able to collect that info um, and just adapt to that, um, to that, to that environment that we're placing them in. So, the biggest thing is just trying to get that ground truth back in a real, real time um, environment. Yeah, Steve, explain a little bit for folks who don't know who Team Rubicon is and what you folks do. So, um, yeah, thank you for asking that. So, Team Rubicon is a disaster response organization, and we are we're not exclusively veterans, but we're predominantly veterans, seventy to eighty percent. We've got around one hundred and fifty thousand volunteers across the country. Uh, we were founded after the 2010 uh, earthquakes in Haiti, um, and since then what we do is uh, we were founded around the idea of taking veteran skill sets, hard and soft skills, and then readapting them and adjusting them to the um, emergency management and incident command uh, leadership skill sets and, and language um, because we found out that they're very, veterans are very unique in their ability to adapt to working in the disaster space similar to uh, working overseas. Uh, let me ask you this then, what are you, are you on the ground first of all in Louisiana? So I am, I am coordinating the planning of our operations at our National Operations Center. Okay. Um, so I'm in contact with all the teams on the ground and uh, piecing together all the information coming through um, along with, with my team of, of awesome volunteers and staff. <laughs> And I ask that just so, and I'm, I'm sure you can tell me from what you're hearing from the field, what are they encountering? What are they finding? I think in some ways, because we didn't see, like before, New Orleans under eight feet of water, everyone seems to think that it, it, it doesn't seem as catastrophic as it actually is. It is, it is absolutely catastrophic. This was, um, it was a very, very significant wind, um, wind-based storm. There was, all, there's water. There is a lot of flooding in areas like Lafitte. Um, for example, we just had a recon team go over there, and they're not getting in without a boat. Um, mm -hmm. So there's it just really depended on where you were in relation to some of the, the bodies of water, but everybody was affected by the extraordinary wind. Um, roofs, telephone poles, um, every anything you can think of. We've seen trees toppled off on houses. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people out there that need a lot of help right now, and, and we're trying to get in there and, and see what we can do. Ed, you know, uh, because we have organizations like Team Rubicon and the Cajun Navies and all of that, it's not a surprise we're going to be hit by these storms. It's not a surprise that this is going to happen to us. We hear all this talk from Washington. I'm getting to my question about what they want to do to improve inter infrastructure. What should be happening in our area? Well, you know, certainly in our area, we can we can learn the lesson from New Orleans and the uh, the levee protection system uh, held uh, beautifully. Uh, and uh, you know, there there are a number of folks, uh, Evan Mintz, calling for the Ike Dyke for you know a constant refrain. Uh, this is something that's kind of progressing along pretty slowly. It, you know, if Ida had come up the ship channel, a 15 foot surge would have been devastating for this city. Um, you know, the infrastructure 
in the United States can be hardened. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, the, the issue is just spending, and it's going to come out of either the consumer's pocket or the voter's pocket, and, and typically they're one and the same. Uh, and nobody likes to commit that large amount of capital. Uh, that's that's the real challenge facing us. The, yeah, but New Orleans survived with the uh, levy protection system. Um, you know, they still aren't up to uh, speed on what they need in terms of, of their pump stations and their backup power stations, but they had just enough to make it through uh, without the city flooding. Um, you know, that's a tremendous accomplishment for the city. Uh, here in Houston, we could we could certainly use the dike. We could use uh, more flood protections, and um, uh, you know work in that direction. Uh, not just for us, but everybody up and down the coast. I mean, we had winter storm Uri. It took out uh, the petrochemical complex not only along the ship channel, but uh, along a good portion of the Texas uh, Gulf Coast. Uh, that supply chain is not going to be restored until January. Of this yeah, year, yeah. and uh, you know, so the impacts are there, whether you, whether you see them day to day or not, and, and you know, just because we don't see uh, trees, you know, and, and flooding in New Orleans, uh, uh, because there was a heck of a pruning 16 years ago with Katrina, you know, mm-hmm. doesn't mean that there's not a lot of damage. They've got 25,000 utility workers on the ground right now. Would it be less expensive to fortify what we currently have or to move all the power lines underground? What What is the wiser choice at this point? Uh, moving everything underground is just remarkably expensive. Um, mm-hmm. uh, maybe 10 to 20 times more expensive than just fortifying what we have up in the air right now. Wow. Steve, let me ask you before I send you back to work. All the folks listening right now want to help. How is the best way to help out? Uh, we're check out teamrubiconusa.org. We are we're always dropping our latest updates. We're also on social media, whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Um, in there, you can find whether you want to volunteer um, or whether you want to donate to the to the response effort. Both of those options are in there. We're always looking for uh, awesome people. All are welcome, veteran or not. Yeah. What are you finding are the needs on the ground right now? Right now, there's it's so many areas are cut off. So many people are without power. Um, it's hard to under other than the just the general physical impact that this is having on people losing their homes. You're having uh, sheltering problems in the middle of a pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, there's uh, there was a period yesterday of of virtually a hundred percent of the most southern portion of Louisiana in, in a blackout. And again, the the wind, I mean, reinforcing some of these things. We've seen a lot of infrastructure improvements over the years with these devastating hurricanes. And, I mean, some of these winds, um, it's incredible what it can do. Um, yeah. So I think the biggest thing is going to be getting people um, somewhere somewhere safe in regards to the pandemic to, to sleep, um, get their families taken care of, and uh, taking care of those vulnerable populations, whether it be medical or, or the elderly, um, trying to find a way to get them out. Um, while more resources come in to to clean up and and get people back on their feet. Steve, again, before I let you go, what's that website? TeamRubiconUSA.org. And they can find out more about what you folks are doing and how they can help you out in your efforts. Steve, thank you very much for talking with us today. A pleasure to have you on. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And Ed, always a pleasure to have you to help us understand this a little bit better. Ernie, my pleasure. And her, uh, let's start off with Steve Fleming is the Operations Support Senior Associate with Team Rubicon, and Ed Hers is an Energy Fellow at the University of Houston. This is Town Square. I'm Ernie Manus, and we pivot now to the global situation. We just heard the president speaking a few minutes ago, and um, we're going to follow up on that conversation with the U.S. withdrawal of Afghanistan now complete. What happens to those left behind? And what's the future of that region and our involvement in it? If you've got questions, insights, thoughts, reactions, our phone lines are open. 888-486-9677. That's 888-4-TOWN-SQUARE. Joining me, though, to field your questions and discuss are Matt Zeller, co-founder of No One Left Behind, also advisory board chair in the Association of Wartime Allies and an Afghanistan combat veteran. Matt, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for having me. 
Thank you. And also returning again is Dr. Javad Zadeh, who was with us uh, last week, I think it was, Associate Professor of Criminal Justice and Sociology at St. Thomas University in Miami. Welcome back, Doctor. Thanks, Ernie. It's good to be with you again. No, it was great. You gave us a lot of good insight last time, so we were hoping you'd be able to join us again today and, and help us with this. Being now that we are in the first day out of Afghanistan at midnight last night, at least their time, a uh, minute before the final uh, U.S. serviceman, as we understand it, left uh, Afghanistan. So, Matt, are we all out? Yeah. I mean, the United States government sure is. Uh, the American people's commitment obviously endures. Um, <clears throat> I represent a massive coalition of, of veterans, diplomats, aid workers, really anybody who has any tie to Afghanistan or has been there over the last 20 years to include a, a massive number of Afghan Americans who have left family behind who remain deeply committed mm -hmm. uh, to Afghanistan, to its people, uh, and just because the American military presence and the American government has given up uh, on them doesn't mean that those of us who love and care for them have. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Javad, Javad, sorry about that. Javad Zadeh, I am curious if you have a reaction to what the president said a few minutes ago. Well, yes, I, I did listen to his entire talk a few minutes ago, and the uh, I think partially what he said uh, is sort of inevitable. That is, uh, I think for the past four administrations, so uh, George W. Bush and then uh, President Obama, Donald Trump and Biden now uh, have been trying to look at some of the ways that they can sort of end uh, the Afghanistan war uh, without any incidents, and at least a chaotic situation that we've witnessed in the past uh, three, four weeks in Afghanistan. And I think part of the <laughs> part of the good thing about President Biden is that he finally decided to be the one to uh, take responsibility for the chaos that will ensue, and as we saw, is probably worse than many people. And I'm talking about people, uh, so entities within this negotiation process that is the Taliban and the U.S. administration and the U.S. military had in mind. Uh, they didn't think it would be as bad. Um, so it's a good thing that he is taking responsibility to withdraw the troops uh, on, you know, the end of yesterday or at least the end of today. And uh, as he said, you probably heard him say that uh, according to the previous administration, troops were supposed to be out by May uh, 1st, I think, or mm -hmm. May 31st, which is a few months ago. And so that wasn't perceivable. Um, and I think it, it's... It's finally, uh, I would call it a a, a, a twenty-year failure that came to an end. At least somebody had the gumption to end it and at least take responsibility. So that's what I deduced from the president's speech today. Matt, did you get to hear the president's remarks? And if so, your takeaway? Yeah, I had a fundamentally different take. Um, mm -hmm. I heard the remarks and I was aghast. I am. I voted for this president. I, I volunteered for his campaign, and I'm sick and tired of an American president that gets up and gaslights the American people. We had this for four years under Trump. For this president to claim that this was the inevitable outcome of whenever we chose to withdraw people is absurd. We have been trying to warn this administration for months. I just put out on Twitter, I've been saving apparently for this moment, the right moment, the right time to do this, a screenshot of an email I sent to his administration on February 9th trying to warn them that they needed to begin this withdrawal, this type of evacuation then. In another universe, in another reality, they listened to us. We began this withdrawal and this evacuation of our Afghan wartime allies back in February, during when it was winter, when it wasn't fighting season, when we still held every single airfield in Afghanistan, when the Afghan government had yet to have collapsed, when the Taliban could not have mounted any type of military campaign because all of the military passes inside of Afghanistan are completely, you know, all the passes that they used to move fighters and troops are completely snowed in during the winter. We could have done this methodically. We could have done this orderly. We could have done it in a way that would have assured that we actually evacuated the people that we mean to. You know, one of the things that nobody is tracking in terms of the press is 
the Defense Department can only account thus far for 8% of the special immigration visa applicants that needed evacuation as of two weeks ago. Where did the other 92% go? They didn't make it onto the airplane, as far as we can tell. This is no, there, this was a failure of colossal proportions. It was set up by successive administrations in their, you know, going back to the Obama administration and the Trump administration and both of their inabilities to effectively administer the special immigration visa program and move people here in a, a you know, efficient manner over the course of years. That's why there was a backlog of individuals that needed immediate evacuation now at the end of the war. But the Biden administration had months to do this. There was a massive organization of faith groups, veterans groups, civil rights groups, humanitarian groups that were trying to warn the administration that they should begin this evacuation months ago. The administration refused to meet with us. And I am sick and tired of the president. I don't like having to get in the media here and beat up on the president and, and call him a liar and a gaslighter. But that's what well, he I'm going to stop you right there. there. That, and I'll give you that, more time that, that, to talk in just a moment. We've got to take a quick break right now. And uh, we're talking with Matt Zeller from No One Left Behind and the Association of Wartime Allies and Dr. Abdi Javadzadeh of the University of St. Thomas, Miami. I'm Ernie Manus. This is Town Square. Our phone lines are open, 888-486-9677. And we'll continue with our comments right after this. I'm Ernie Manus, and this is Town Square. We'll continue our discussion about Afghanistan in just a moment. But first, coming up on tomorrow's show, more than 650 Texas laws go into effect tomorrow. Voting laws, permitless carry, and a ban on critical race theory are among the newly passed legislation. Tomorrow, experts break down and discuss new Texas laws. You can email us your questions, curiosities, or um, requesting more information about some of these laws at questions at townsquaretalk.org or tweet us at Town Square Talk. Also remember that Town Square with Ernie Manus is available as a podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Now back to our current conversation with Dr. Abdi Javad Zadeh. I'm so sorry I screw that up every time. Javad Zadeh from the St. Thomas University in Miami and Matt Zeller from No One Left Behind and the Association of Wartime Allies. Matt, I kind of cut you off when you were talking a minute ago so we could hit our break. But let me ask you this. How could this have been done better? Uh, and I know you, you laid that out. It seems as though, I guess, let me rephrase the question. How could they not have known this was going to happen? How could we have ended up in this situation and not understood if you're taking out your troops before you've taken out your people, you're going to have problems? I have no idea. Profound ignorance massive incompetence I, are, are just, you know, sheer arrogance. I, I have no idea why they refuse to meet with us. I can't wait for Congress to hold hearings so that we can formally ask them. I yeah. am determined to get to the bottom of this. We have an obligation to ensure that this never happens again. Unlike at the end of the Vietnam War, veterans are organized. We are politically organized. We have public support in a way that we never had at the end of that war. And we are determined that this time we're not going to leave it so that this ever happens again. It, it, we have, if, we, if we do, then shame on us, because at this point we have the means to, to, to fix this. Dr. Um, Javad this is clearly today. a problem that just keeps going on over and over at the end of every war. Dr. Javad Zadeh, I, I asked you this question last time you were on the show, and I'm still perplexed by it. The same question. Who, what, who is asleep at the switch, or am I just totally misunderstanding the situation? I, I don't think you're misunderstanding it. The problem is it's sort of upside down, the way we've been given uh, what's going on. Uh, and the reason why I say it's upside down is because we keep thinking that uh, it was a U.S. military and political decision to leave Afghanistan. It was, in fact, the other way around. And I think uh, the president today sort of mentioned it, but not in the same light that we're talking about. He said that he does not want more Americans and American troops getting killed in Afghanistan which means uh, we weren't so much in support of leaving, whether immediately, you know, abruptly or methodically, as Matt suggested. That wasn't our choice. 
it was what was pushed upon the U.S. and the U.S. military by the Taliban. So in the negotiations for the past few years, they had come to the agreement that they will stop killing U.S. soldiers if we negotiate with them and leave the sooner, uh, the sooner we can. So uh, I know everyone wants this to be methodic and slower, and like Matt said, and I completely empathize with what Matt is talking about, but uh, it was not our choice to make. And the Taliban um, uh, are forceful enough or were forceful enough militarily to have to pressure us to leave. So it wasn't a choice that we made. And then so the choice would be, why do we... Why do we leave so abruptly in such a chaotic condition? And why don't we do this methodically for the, you know, a few years on? So start today and then end maybe in one year or two years. And even, no one will get hurt. But not even a few years we'll get, on. If we're listening to the president, he said 120,000 people were airlifted out over a short period of time. So they obviously have the ability right. to move large numbers of people relatively quickly. We know from at least the last administration, if not earlier, that, you know, we were planning to to leave. So I guess I, I'm in the same school of thought with Matt here about, OK, but you plan it. And if you are negotiating this this leaving, well, maybe things should have happened a little sooner. It's not like we're saying that we had to wait till the last minute. Nobody was waiting to the last minute, but it didn't seem as though things were in motion until they were too late to be successful. And it seems like something anybody in logistics and planning would know would not go smoothly. And now there's the question of how many people may not have gotten out that we needed to get out. And I'm not just talking about U.S. citizens, but also talking about allies. So I am very perplexed about how this came to be. And, Doctor, do you think this will be looked at as one of the U.S.'s major blunders of military wartime? I, I really do. Of course it will be. Uh, I was just talking in class today to my students about how we spent, so, you know, if you, if you read estimates, uh, the conservative estimates are $1 trillion and the more liberal ones up to $3 trillion. And the president sort of mentioned that it's almost $300 million a day uh, because, you know, it's either $1 trillion or $3 trillion. So it could right. be not $300 million a day, it could be $150 million, or it could be $400 million. Either way, we spent so much money and then loss of lives, both, both troops, American civilians, Afghani civilians, Afghani uh, troops, and so forth. So all of the hundreds of thousands of people dead, and then all of this money spent, where we have the same force, the Taliban, that we ousted or overthrew in October of 2001, sort of, when we went into Afghanistan, or at least started the war, uh, after 20 years to almost absolutely no avail because the same forces come to power, that is, the Taliban comes to power, and, and in a matter of, it happened in three to four weeks, it's almost impossible for any military force to take over a country as large mm -hmm. as Afghanistan in three, four weeks, which means, again, negotiations were in place and we allowed this to happen. Otherwise, had there been any kind of a detriment or, or, or impediment, military impediments in front of the Taliban, they couldn't have taken over the entire country in three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. This is an incredible, incredibly fast, I don't know if you want to call it invasion or takeover by one particular force that is not even, uh, you know, a traditional military, conventional military force. These are right. mainly guerrilla fighters, and they have now uh, come to be not just guerrilla fighters, but also the state. So, in you know, in, in political sociology, uh, we have this term that we call... Uh, war making and state making, which means entities that go through war and persist through war can can get ultimately to form the state and make the government apparatus, mm -hmm. which is exactly what happened in Afghanistan. That is, this 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 body of guerrilla movement, the insurgency of Afghanistan, had any anywhere from twenty to thirty years. So, if you want to go back to the nineteen eighties, maybe even forty years 
to prepare itself to not only become guerrilla fighters and militants, but also to be able to make a state apparatus. So they were able to create such a large bureaucratic system, not just a military system, uh, but a bureaucratic system for them to claim that we can ultimately become the state. So now what they're doing is not so much military, according to even their spokesperson in Afghanistan. They said that we're seizing military action, and now we're taking over state apparatus, which also means they have had bureaucracy in place. And now they're in the process of negotiating with China, negotiating with Iran, Turkey, Russia, and some countries uh, in the region to be able to run the government. So again, I go back to what I said originally, we have to look at this process as a long process of negotiation. And then, uh, as you said just a minute ago, a failure on our behalf or the U.S. behalf to be able to make a dent in what went on in Afghanistan 20, 25 years ago compared to today after you know we were in place uh, for such for such such long time for 20 years, and we weren't. I think one thing has been done though, and this is also in the process of negotiations. The Taliban has backed off from some of their fundamental and fanatic stance that they used to take in relation to women especially. Also, in relation to punishment as a result of breaking Sharia law. Uh, that's one thing that has changed. But I, I don't think that's in relation to the U.S., nor is it in relation to the population in Afghanistan. I think that is in relation to the international uh, right. Setting. They want to they want to play on the world stage, so they've got to make some accommodations to get there. But right. I think a lot of people are are concerned that these may not be genuine positions, and we may see it slipping back to a more conservative spot uh, than they're even at now. Uh, our phone number here is eight 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 four eight six nine six seven seven. I've hoarded you two for me the whole time, but I do want to grab a call if I can. Josh is on the line. Josh, what's on your mind? Thank you for taking my call. I'm just curious with uh, the comment that I'm getting from people. If only they understand where the president is coming from. What was his explanation? What was his defense? Let us be realistic. No matter when you fall out, either earlier, late, or ever, it's going to be clear. These are enemies waiting for an opportunity to do whatever they can. Besides, an agreement has been made in May. He did everything. If those who have come out in May and start killing, I guess they're going to be the president. Josh, I'm, Josh, I'm going to stop you there because we're running tight on time, but I think we got your point. I, I would just say, I think, yes, I think everyone would agree there was going to be some amount of chaos. There was, that was inevitable. But it's how you manage that chaos, how you deal with it. Matt, for example, this is not the first time we have pulled out of a region, and it seems as though in other cases we have managed it better. Am I, am I wrong about that? No, we haven't managed it better. This has been, this has been part and parcel for our, our, apparently our country's course. I, I'm sorry, I have to go back to what the professor just said, because that is just blatantly wrong. I, I, we cannot allow the Taliban, and it, it begins here at home, with people to apologize for them or try to nuance their behavior. These people are the modern day equivalent of the Nazi party. And forgive me, but having been the only person in this conversation who's fought them and served in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. for you guys to sit here and try to claim that they've somehow become this like modern day version of like they've reformed, they've banned women across the country. I have video of them actively hunting down people. I am personally trying to get out of Afghanistan right now. They are going around and mass executing people. I know of it three, at least three of them. I've personally watched the films of them shooting people in the back of the head extrajudicially. Yesterday, they took an American-made Black Hawk helicopter, and they flew it over the city of Kandahar. And you know what they threw out of that Black Hawk helicopter? Bodies. They hung people from an American-made helicopter while they flew it around the city of Hel Kandahar, and they hung them by their neck out the side of the helicopter. It's on 
Twitter if you want to go see it. These people are not reformed. They're barbaric. They're not the legitimate government of Afghanistan. They overthrew the democratically elected government of Afghanistan. If they wanted to be accepted by the Afghan people, they would have stood for election in the coming Afghan elections as a legitimate party in the Afghan political state. Yes, they had their own shadow state set up that for years have been waiting and, and, and basically ready to come in and take over the Afghan state if they could knock it off. But this is This is not somebody that we should be looking as an active negotiating partner. And that has been the failure of this administration and the previous administration. The reason why we're in this position in the first place is because the Trump administration surrendered to these people. And in that surrender agreement that Pompeo signed over a year ago, they forced the Afghan, legitimate Afghan government to release over 5,000 fighters from prisons that we had spent the better part of decades rolling these people up and arresting and detaining them and moving them from the battlefield. Who do you think just led the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan? Those 5,000 fighters. And by the way, one of the very first things that those 5,000 fighters did when they took over the country in the last three weeks is they went back to all the other prisons that were holding some of their fighters and they released those people as well, to include the ISIS-K fighters that just went and perpetrated the attack on American Marines at our air at the airfield. Okay, Matt, I'm going to hold you right here because I have another question please, I want to ask you before. You, please, I know please, I interrupt I because I've it. only got so much please, time know, left. But hold on, I want okay. you're, you're going to let me finish my last sentence. So the right. entire time that the entire time that we've had a problem is this: we have been trying to trust terrorists with our security, and what it has cost us is American lives and Afghan lives. Okay, let me ask you this, Matt. Do you know what the U.S. policy currently is for getting, for retrieving our allies at the end of a conflict? Do we have a policy, and was that followed or not followed? We do not have a policy, and that's why Congress has to hold hearings on this, and it's going to have to legislate that policy. Look, there's a simple way to fix this. Currently, right now, there's an army of PhDs at the Pentagon whose sole job in life is to think about how we invade every country on the planet. And there's a go-to-war plan for everybody to include Vatican City, Canada, the Maldives, you name it, right? Because God forbid you, you're trying to write the go-to-war plan while you're also sending the Marines to wherever you're trying to get them. So these go-to-war plans are constantly revised for changes in geopolitical factors, environmental factors, etc. What they don't currently consider is they don't currently consider how we're going to protect the locals who partner with us in future conflicts, and that if needs be, how we'll extract those people should they need extraction at the end of a conflict. What we have been arguing for years is that Congress should require that from a doctrinal standpoint, the United States government has to think up from the nanosecond it decides to send troops, diplomats, even Peace Corps volunteers downrange, You have to understand that at some point asking people to partner with us might fundamentally excommunicate them from the societies around them, and that in so doing that they're going to need to be protected and removed, and that there should be programs and systems and personnel identified ahead of time on how to do that. We must legislate to ensure that at the end of future conflicts, this never happens again. There should never be another situation in which American troops are leaving before the local allies that have assisted us for over 20 years. It should okay, always Matt, be in the other direction. I've got to hold you there because we are out of time. I truly appreciate all that you had to say, and I hope you'll come back another time when we can spend more time when we're not dividing the show in half. Uh, so, Matt, thank you very much. That is Matt Zeller, co-founder of No One Left Behind and advisory board chair of the Association of Wartime Allies and an Afghan combat, combat veteran. We thank him for joining us. And Dr. Javad Zadeh is an associate professor of criminal justice and sociology at St. Thomas University in Miami. And Professor, I hope you'll come back and join us again. Of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you missed any of today's show, remember Town Square is available as a daily podcast. You can subscribe on our website at townsquaretalk.org or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Town Square Talk. Tomorrow morning uh, with Houston Matters with Craig Cohen, they'll be taking a look at what's coming up in the second Texas special session at 9 a.m. And then what we'll be doing at 3 o'clock is looking at what new laws are going into effect starting tomorrow that's on our show tomorrow at 3 p.m on town square on news 88.7 or streaming live at townsquaretalk.org 
For Houston Public Media, I'm Ernie Manoos. Thanks for listening, and we will talk again tomorrow. Town Square with Ernie Manoos is a production of Houston Public Media. The opinions expressed by guests and callers do not necessarily reflect the views of the staff, management, or underwriters of this station. Medical opinions should not replace consultation with a medical professional.